Hello and welcome back to the third episode of my bus painting series. In today's video I want to show you how I painted the torso including the uniform and belts using oil paints over the acrylic pre-coloring. So fasten your seat belts and let's go. I again started by drying out the oil paints on a piece of cardboard and placing them on my palette. If you are interested in learning more about the basics using oil paints, please check out uh, the second episode where I am explaining this more in detail. I started to mix the green tone for the uniform without a specific formula. I used two sap green tones and added terra rosa, yellow ochre and naples yellow until I was satisfied with the result. With adding white to the base paint I mixed three lighter versions for the highlights. And with adding burnt umber I mixed darker versions for the shadow areas. I started the painting progress with painting the base paint aka shadow color one into the places where the pre-coloring showed me the darker spots would be. If you are interested in learning how to do a pre-shading and pre-coloring, check out the first episode of my bust painting series. The paint was applied diluted with thinner and applied in several thin layers to not cover the pre-coloring completely. And with this base paint or shadow color one, the areas painted were the biggest. With the darker colors later, the painted areas became smaller and smaller. And here I'm starting to apply the second shadow color in a more precise way in, in smaller areas. And again, like in the second episode, I speed up the video speed from time to time because I want to show this complex painting progress as detailed as possible without being too boring. I'm again using Princeton and Winston and Newton brushes. For me they are the best brushes and perfect for precise painting and you really feel the quality. And the second shadow color was also applied diluted uh, in several layers until I was satisfied with the coverage. And here I'm starting to apply the third and darkest shadow color in the most dark and deepest places. All seam lines and crevices were also emphasized this way. Here you can see how I'm using a filbert brush to blend the just painted layer into the previously painted ones. Like this you can avoid hard edges and achieve smoother color transitions. And as you can see I again made several passes until I was satisfied with the coverage of the paint. Now it was time to add the first highlight color. I herefore grabbed me my brushes for the lighter paints and 
painted them into the places where the pre-coloring showed me where the lighter spots would be. Before I started with the highlight paint, I made sure that the painted shadow colors were completely dry. Otherwise it would be possible that the shadow paints get reactivated by the used thinner. So you better make sure that the previously painted layers are completely dry. Okay, we are skipping highlight color 2 and jump directly to highlight color 3. The painting progress is pretty much equal to applying the shadow paints and you paint smaller areas with a second highlight paint and then jump to even smaller areas with the third highlight paint. I'm using a Princeton short liner here and this brush is very precise and ideal for small areas like crevices and folds. And this highest highlight was also used for outlining details and seam lines. And after I applied all highlight paints, I switched back and forth between shadows and highlights and repainted areas until I was satisfied with the contrast. As you can see, this switching back and forth is time consuming, but I think it's totally worth the effort. To save some time between the layers drying, I can highly recommend using a slow cooker. 20 minutes on low and the previously painted layer is dry enough that you can continue working instead of uh, waiting till the next day. But you better set yourself a timer because you don't want to forget your piece in the slow cooker and get the resin melted. After I was finally satisfied with the contrast between shadows and highlights, I flooded the whole bust with the thinner and made a unifying glaze. I herefore used the base color and this smoothens the transitions and makes the look more unified. And with a dry brush I removed the pool paint in the crevices so that it doesn't cover any painted shadows. And this was the last step for painting the uniform and we continue with painting the scarf. For the scarf I wanted to try a different approach. I mixed me a new green tone and with this base paint made four thin glazes to benefit from the pre-shading. I then added a small amount of burnt umber to mix me one shadow color and painted it into the deeper and darker spots. And with adding white, I mixed me one highlight paint and applied this in the more exposed lighter spots. For this smaller part of this bust, I was hoping for a quicker approach. I would not choose this approach for the whole uniform, but for a small part like the scarf, I thought it would be worth a try. I then added more white until it was almost pure white and by stippling the paint in the lighter areas I tried to replicate a fabric like 
textured look. And after this was completely dry, I made a unifying glaze with the base paint and moved on to the next step, the khaki parts. For the khaki parts I use the traditional approach with shadows and highlights and therefore mixed me a suitable base paint. This again was done without a specific formula and more by feeling until I was satisfied. And with adding white I mixed two lighter versions and with burnt umber two darker versions. I then started by base painting the whole khaki parts with two slightly thicker layers of the base paint. Then again like at the uniform I started to apply the first shadow color into the slightly darker areas and blended them into the base paint using the filbert brush. And here I am already using the second shadow color for painting the more deeper and darker details. And again after the shadows came the highlights and I painted the more exposed and lighter areas. And again I skipped the first highlight color and jumped directly to the second highlight. Somehow the khaki parts were more challenging to me because there were not that much crevices and folds like at the uniform. So I cannot really say that I'm completely satisfied but in the end I think the overall look will be not that bad in the end. And again after switching between shadows and highlights several times I made a unifying finishing glaze with the base paint. Like my reference pictures showed me the backpack has light green belts and seams and I therefore mixed me a suitable green tone and painted them like this. Like I said before, I wasn't really happy with the look of the khaki parts. So I decided to emphasize the shadowed areas using paints gray. This is a great color for creating clean shadows, not that muddy looking like using burnt umber. And as you just saw, I used it to turn down the white in the Screaming Eagles patch to make it look less brand new. And again I reworked the highlighted parts with using the second highlight color again. And to unify these layers I again made a glaze with the base paint. I'm not completely sure if these shoulder pads are leather parts, but I decided to paint them like this. I herefore started with base painting them in a suitable brown tone. And to simulate some wear and tear, I lightened the paint up until it was almost pure white to paint some cracked leather.
and this very bright color was toned down a bit and unified with the glaze using the base paint again. To begin painting the metal parts I started by base painting them with black oil paint. All eyelets and buckles were base painted this way. For some chipping effects I used acrylic copper paint to simulate exposed metal parts. And you have to be very careful because you don't want to make corrections using metal paints. And to unify the metal parts and make them look a bit less shiny I made a very thin glaze with black oil paint over all the chipped areas. For the US lettering on the backpack I again used black oil paint and tried to outline the lettering with a very thin brush. And after I was satisfied with the result I repainted it with a slightly wider brush and used the opportunity to emphasize all seams with the black oil paint. And as a final step for the torso I used thick black acrylic paint to paint the pole and the underside of the bust. And then it was time to put this piece aside and paint the bazooka. The bazooka was also pre-colored in the first episode using acrylics and I made two green glazes with thin oil paints as a base paint. And with burnt sienna I base painted the wooden shoulder rest. Then I tried to paint my first wood grain in 110 scale and I started with burnt umber to paint a thick dark grain. And of course don't forget to paint the sides and the backside because you never know what is visible when this piece is standing in the showcase. Then I mixed some raw umber with a lot of white and painted a lighter grain between the darker ones. And for some variation I mixed burnt sienna with white to paint some orangish grain. And to unify all these bright colors and build up some depth I made several glazes using the base paints for the wood grain. And here you can see the advantage of using oil paints because all those previous layers are visible and you can achieve really cool effects using glazes over glazes. Then it was time to concentrate on the metal parts. To bring some variation in the metal surface I applied highly lightened base paint thinned with liquid this time. By stippling this mix onto the surface I could achieve some color distraction and blended it with a dry stiff brush. And as I wanted to paint some chipping I used this mix for painting the first lighter chips. Because liquid dries out glossy I made two thin green glazes with the base paint to knock that down. Using liquid here was good for achieving a distracted metal surface. But you have to be careful when you for example use it on painting a face because of this glossy finish. This is not really a 
bad problem, but you maybe have to make an additional step with flat varnish. Then I painted the dark metal chips using paints grey. And I want to use this opportunity to again mention Small Soldier, who is uh, my role model when it comes to bust painting. Basically everything I know about bust painting I learned from him and his YouTube guides. So if you are interested in bust painting, I can highly recommend to give his channel a look. After I was done with the dark chips, I base painted the belt of the bazooka in a mixed green tone. This was a rather similar green tone I used for the chin strap of the helmet, so this piece looks more unified and again I used paints grey oil paint to paint shadowed areas. And here again don't forget the underside. And of course where are darker areas there are lighter areas and I mixed the lighter tone by adding white and painted the more exposed areas. To simulate a fabric texture I lightened up the base paint with a lot of white and applied it in a stippling way to paint countless small dots. And again after it was dry made a unifying glaze. I then again used black oil paint to base paint the isolator, all buckles and eyelets. And here I am using the black oil paint to darken the rear opening and to simulate some suit from firing the rockets. And here I'm using an old stiff brush to blend this suit simulation into the surface. As far as I know this isolator is a piece of rubber and I used white oil paint very diluted to paint some wear and tear. And again unified the surface with a black glaze. Because I really love rusty looks I couldn't step away from using some rust effects on the biggest chips. I'm not saying that this is a very realistic approach to painting a bazooka, but I this time prefer the look over the realism. The application was as usual, after painting the enamel paints let it dry and then blend it with a thinner moistened brush. And to outline details and emphasize some darker areas I made a pin wash using a panel line wash. This was also applied and after a short drying time I cleaned it up with a thinner moistened brush. To finish the metal parts I used VMS metal pigments and polished them into the black oil paint using a rubber silicon brush. And using graphite pencils I was able to reach the smaller places like the screws or emphasize the effect even more on the bigger parts. And just like at an armored model the chipped edges were treated with the graphite pencils too. For some smaller spots like the screws or the buckles of the belt I used metallic acrylic paint to emphasize these chips a bit more and then again made a thin black glaze with black oil paint to make it a bit less shiny. 
because I liked the way the wood grain was looking when the paint was still wet. I tried to recreate this effect using wet effects or glossy varnish. But this was not uh, bringing the effect I was hoping for and believe it or not, but pigment fixer brought the effect I was hoping for. And with that we can finally call this bazooka done and move on to the next step, the assembly. I decided against using super glue to attach the head to the torso. I instead used green stuff for this job. This gave me a bit more time to place and uh, arrange the head and it uh, had a bit more volume so the head ended up a bit higher. For attaching the bazooka I again used super glue with activator spray and that was the final step for today's video. Thank you very much for watching my video and enduring it until the end. If you like what you saw please consider supporting me by subscribing. And then you will not miss the fourth and last episode where I will build and paint the base and unify the bust with the base with the last finishing touches. So I'm looking forward to your feedback and stay safe.